Hello, everybody, and welcome back into the Hockey Writers Podcast YouTube edition. Um, we're we're on the eve of day one of free agency, and needless to say, it's been a crazy day. Um, <laughs> from major signings to major trades, from a major sign that just happened like an hour ago uh, as well. We have lots to talk about in this show, and I'm joined in by a few writers here at the Hockey Writers. I'm Melissa Boyd, who covers the Montreal Canadiens. Colin Newby covers the Philadelphia Flyers and Austin Stanovich, who covers the LA Kings. Surprisingly, none of those teams did a, a lot of the major moves, but uh, we'll react to a lot of the NHL stuff that's happened so far. So um, how's everyone doing on this crazy first day of free agency? Yeah, a crazy first day and there's still a lot of uh, good players uh, still available. So maybe day two will be exciting as well. <clears throat> yeah, well, there's still a few major pieces uh, too. So, uh, Colin, how's it going? Uh, on you know, it's a crazy day so far. <laughs> yeah, I just drove down to the Jersey Shore, and by the time I got here <laughs> to Johnny Gaudreau's home state, he had signed <laughs> with Columbus. <laughs> with Philadelphia, New Jersey, or New York, go to Columbus. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then Austin, who who uh, covers the LA Kings and on the West Coast, uh, just like me. Um, how's it going? <laughs> Still processing that Goudreau trade. Uh, kind of celebrating Johnny Hockey out of the Pacific Division, out of the yes. West General. He doesn't get to terrorize the Kings anymore, which is awesome. Yeah, I'm at the same boat. Out of the Pacific Division, he always torched the Canucks, and no pun intended, uh, with the Flames. So um, let's start there. I mean, it's obviously, I mean, Johnny Goudreau. Um, Melissa, did you expect it that he would go to Columbus? You know, like we said, New Jersey Devils, uh, New York Islanders were favoring, favored there. I'm talking about the Philadelphia Flyers maybe getting in there. Um, what would you think of the, tri the signing in general? And to take a little less money, uh, yeah. going to Columbus. Yeah, no, that was, uh, uh, we, as I was saying just before we, uh, we got on here is it always seems like at the end of the day is when the, the big, you know, shocker comes <laughs> and, you know, you're like, and, you know, you, you see the tweet and you're like, is it from a verified account? Yeah. <laughs> is that his real account? Okay. Okay. Um, and then you're like processing it, but you know, like I've kind of gone through a lot of emotions <laughs> since it happened. <laughs> Um, you know what? It is nice to see a star player sign in a small, small market. Small market. Um, it's it's good for I think it's good for the league, and especially yeah. like knowing that Columbus has lot has seen a lot of their free agents walk. You know, Artemi Panarin, Seth Jones, Matt Duchesne. So it's nice to see that um, they get sort of rewarded in some way, um, and they obviously have a great young like a lot a ton of great prospects um it's just an interesting decision on gojo's part i'm anxious to hear from him uh yeah. why uh he chose columbus because i don't think they're closer to winning than calgary what is or orders the islanders or the devil so it's an interesting choice on his part so i'm anxious to see the reasoning there <laughs> yeah and colin you know now that Goudreau signed in Columbus. Uh, Patrick Lane is still not signed. Uh, do you think this means he's traded or do they figure out a way to uh, sign him to have Goudreau because you'd want them to be on the same line, I would think. <laughs> well, the real stunner here is with cap space. How yeah, do yeah. you, how do you fit all of this in and what is line a going to command? It's just <laughs> such a, such a move out of left field that nobody really saw yeah. coming. So now you have to put together the pieces, and that's something that's going to have to happen with Patrick Laine. Um, but like you said, I think he fits on a line with Gaudreau. Uh, you've got the sniper in Laine, and you can have the smaller player, Gaudreau, as kind of a setup man. Had a career year in Calgary last year. He can be that playmaker that sets up Laine. So I hope they can keep both. Yeah, I mean, it, it's an interesting situation there. And I think I thought their main priority would be re-sign Lane and then go from there. But now they're adding another big guy to the to the group. And, you know, now they got to figure it out. And uh, Mark, who covers the Columbus Blue Jackets and credentialed with them uh, for the Hockey Writers here, is saying that, he you know, they'll probably re-sign him. So they're going to have to figure out a way because um, I think he really fits in Columbus. Um, Lane does. So 
Um, we'll see what happens the next few days. Um, or next, or you know, in the off season here too. Yeah, just um, as I could, I yeah. want to say I really like this move by Columbus, though, because they've done a similar thing before. I said this at the trade deadline a couple of years ago when they won it all in and eventually beat Tampa. Basically, what they're doing is telling you that they're not the Arizona Coyotes. Yes, yeah. We're not just going to sit here and accept defeat. Even if we're not going to win a Stanley Cup, we're going to die trying. Yeah. And that's why you signed Johnny. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Austin, I mean, we even we heard about all the things with, with Calgary and that he took, we obviously took less money to go to Columbus. Um, is that anything, have anything to do with the situation in Calgary? I mean, there was, there's talk that it was because of family. He wants to go out East for that. But um, was there anything that he just didn't, maybe didn't like the direction the, the Calgary Flames were going or they didn't, well, they obviously offered him enough money. Yeah. I'm not sure that I like Melissa. I'd be really interested to hear from Goudreau himself. Cause I can't really piece together why he would take less money just to go to Columbus. Like I'm sure he has a good reason, but I don't understand what that reason would be right now. Uh, obviously playing for Daryl Sutter. I saw it a lot with the Kings. Some guys do get burnt out. Maybe mm-hmm. he just got burned out a little quicker than other guys do. Maybe not. I'm not sure. Uh, I also really like this for Columbus. I, it makes me think of the Warinsky re-signing where it's a message to the league. We can – with Warinsky, it was we can retain guys, and with Goudreau, it's we can bring in – we can attract the big free agent guys, and I think that's a really good signal to send out to the league. Um, I The line A thing, I don't know how they're going to do it. It would be impressive mm-hmm. if they did. My first two thoughts, honestly, were, oh, my God, I need to see Kent Johnson and Johnny Goudreau on a line mm-hmm. together. Oh. That is going to be so much fun to watch. And Cole Sillinger on a line with Goudreau is really interesting uh, to me. Mm-hmm. He's another, like you said, a playmaker-sniper combo. Sillinger's a, a real sniper, too. That could be real good for Columbus moving forward. Well, Columbus is going to be an exciting team to watch next year. Uh, with all their young talent and with now Goudreau in the fold, too, I mean, my gosh. And if they can get somehow get <laughs> Lonnie resigned, too, that team's going to be exciting to watch and uh, dangerous in that metropolitan division too. There's another power that's kind of mm-hmm. coming, coming to the forefront too. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens uh, coming into next season. Let's move to another big one uh, happened earlier in the day. Probably one of the first moves. Um, Jack Campbell goes to the Edmonton Oilers and we'll start with you, Austin, on this one, since we're in the West here, how big is this for the Edmonton Oilers to sign a legitimate starting goaltender in Campbell um, does this kind of fit pieces together now? They could actually make a run at the Stanley Cup um, with some good goaltending. Yeah, I think this is going to be huge for Edmonton with Goudreau leaving the Flames. There's obviously that first place in the Pacific up for grabs, I think. And I'd put Edmonton probably as a front runner at this point after the Campbell signing, just because they were able to do so much with uh, pretty subpar goaltending for Mike Smith. I mean, no offense to the guy, but mm-hmm. he's like 40 years old and isn't exactly a superstar back there. Um, I'm really happy for Jack Campbell too. I got to watch his kind of resurgence in LA when he came in after the tough time in Dallas and got his career back on track. So that's really good to see. The beauty with the Oilers is they don't need a superstar goalie. They just need someone good enough. Again, they were able to get the Western conference finals with Mike Smith back there. If they get even league average goaltending, they're a scary team just off the back. I mean, Connor McDavid showed what he could do, and Leon Dreisaitl isn't exactly a slouch, so that's going to be huge for them. Yeah, I mean, Campbell, he's one, like, in Toronto, I mean, he became a fan favorite, too, like, uh, and that's going to be big for, like, locker room type things, too, because he's he's one of those guys, a great personality in the dressing room. He's, he's one of those uh, big character guys too, which I think that's going to really help the Edmonton Oilers. Um, Melissa, I mean, you have, you've had more experience watching Jack Campbell because <laughs> they're in the same division. Nope. Um, what type of, is this a good fit for Edmonton? I mean, they had some other options. Darcy <clears throat> Kemper was another one. Um, they could have gone trade route uh, type thing, but uh, does Campbell kind of represent a good fit in Edmonton? I think, it, I think he does. And I mean, I think, like if Ken Holland didn't get a starting goaltender this off season, like, oh. you know, you know, things were going to be burned in Edmonton or, you know, so I think it is a good fit. It's interesting that Campbell would choose to go from a high pressure market in Toronto and go, and now he's in another high pressure yeah. market in Edmonton. We know what kind of personality he is, you know, he's soft spoken. He doesn't want to get anybody's way. He, you know, it, it might work because 
with McDavid and Dreisaitl and all those guys there, actually the pressure might be off him a little bit. You know, we know that um, how strong uh, they are up front and how offensively gifted they are. So maybe there's less pressure on him in Edmonton. And, but yeah, I just think it's, as Austin said, it's just, it was so important for them to shore up their goaltending. And now I think they're legitimate contenders in the West for sure. Well, they finally got someone that wanted to come to Edmonton. So (laughs) (laughs) because they tried, they tried when Markstrom was on the market, they, and he didn't want to go. So um, finally got their goaltender and uh, pretty good price tag too, I think for him. Mm -hmm. So, Colin, we'll just go to another goaltender and talk about Darcy Kemper. I mean, he won the Stanley Cup, and now he's on another team. <laughs> they signed with the Washington Capitals, who they basically kind of cleaned house with their goaltending, uh, got rid of Samsonov. Uh, do you think he's a good fit in Washington now? I mean, now he's, like you say, he's gone off the Stanley Cup. He doesn't return to the team they won the Stanley Cup with. Uh, what do you think? I think this is a good move for Washington. If you look – Side by side at what Campbell got and what Kemper got, Kemper's only, I think, 0.25 more in average annual value, and I do think he's a better goaltender. Um, he didn't really light the world on fire in the playoffs. Uh, kind of didn't have to because <laughs> McKinnon and McCarr did it for him. But um, one stat that I always look at uh, for goaltenders is goal saved above expected, trying to get it a little more into the advanced stats. Um, but there's a huge disparity between Kemper and Campbell here. Mm. Kemper was fifth in the NHL. Jack Campbell was 68th uh, with a negative value. So I would say with the financial investment that the Caps gave Kemper versus the one that the Oilers gave Campbell, I think the Caps are the clear winners here. Yeah, oh, and the Capitals, they need to, goal t- they need to shore up their goaltending too because uh, there's always been question marks um, throughout last season and uh, they're still in that kind of window of winning, I guess, and uh, they're going to have to deal with that. And it's going to be interesting to see what other moves they do because, you know, they still haven't addressed that center position. Uh, they've re-signed Johansson, who doesn't really fit that center second line guy. Um, they're losing Backstrom for a while. I mean, they may go for Kadri still and, they were in talks with JT Miller. I mean, who knows? We'll, we'll see what the other moves they make, but they've definitely got a pretty good goaltender um, for the future now in Kemper. Though, well, speaking of Samsonov, uh, he went to Ma- we went to the Toronto Maple Leafs, and uh, now they have a new tandem. We talked about Jack Campbell, who's gone. Um, Austin, what, what do you think about this one? Uh, Samsonov goes to the Maple Leafs, now tandem in tandem with uh, Matt Murray, who came over from the Ottawa Senators. Do you think it's going to be a 1A, 1B type thing now, or is that going to be a clear starter? I think that Toronto's hoping one of them makes that decision for them. I think their bet was these are two guys with some good potential. We'll let them battle down. Hopefully one of them becomes a clear starter or worst case scenario. This kind of like what I said with Edmonton, they don't need a superstar in net. They need kind of league average goaltending. And maybe one of these guys gets really hot around playoff times and we can just ride him to a cup. I mean, Matt Murray got real hot in Pittsburgh a couple of times and it worked out for him. So the way I view that is kind of get, get these two guys who can be good and hope one of them is good. And I don't mind that from them. I mean, again, that team's so stacked that worst case scenario, they kind of do what they did with Campbell at the end of last season and outscore teams. They can do it. Hmm. Well, and that's the thing. They're both, they're both have, have, you know, Samsonov's had some good stretches in Washington. Matt Murray, we know what he did in, in Pittsburgh, and we won cups. Um, was up and down in Ottawa. I think injuries kind of played into that, too. So it's not like you're getting two goaltenders that have never been there as starters. So I think that's a pretty good move for the Maple Leafs. I mean, um, I think going in a tandem is probably the best for both of them. I don't think you want to throw all that workload on, on them. So uh, we'll see what happens there in the goaltending in Toronto because – and there's another one. They and the, the thing is though, it's not been the goaltending that's been the problem to get them out of the first round. It's been <laughs> it's been other players not stepping up or just bad luck, or I don't know what it is. But uh hopefully they're probably hoping maybe maybe it's Campbell's problem. I don't know. <laughs> but they had Anderson too, and they weren't getting out of the first round. So it's not it's not like it's been the goaltending. Let's move. We talked about Ottawa here. Let's talk about these two teams, Detroit Red Wings and the Ottawa Senators. Both teams didn't make the playoffs. 
and they made both have made huge moves in the last few days. Um, we'll start in Detroit, who signed David Perron, Dominic Kubelik, Andrew Kopp, Ben Sherratt, Oli Mata. I think I, I think I got them all. And then Billy Huso, who I mean, the, that signing came official after free agency opened. Um, Melissa, you wrote the article on Perron, so. What do you think of these moves that Detroit's making? I mean, are they pushing towards the playoffs now? I mean, is that is that Eisman's thinking now that they're possibly a playoff team now? Yeah, well, it's uh, you know we were talking about Toronto before, and you know um, with Ottawa and Detroit improving this way, the Atlantic Division just got really t- like <laughs> extra tough all of a sudden, as well as as well as the Metro Division. So it's interesting, but. Um, it's funny, uh, t- Tony Wolak, who writes for the Red Wings here at the Hockey Writers, he sent out a tweet this afternoon that made me laugh. He said, Steve Eiserman did say that he had a long list of free agents he was going to look at. I didn't think he was going to sign all of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it's it feels like, you know, oh, here it comes Stevie Y. Like he yeah. is sending a message. Okay, we're in this now. Um, and apparently I can't remember who I saw might put this out, but they may be in on other stuff, mm. um, trade wise as well. So it looks like, um, Stevie wise had enough of the losing and, um, it's moving on it. I like all the signings. I think mm. it works for them. Um, you know, the Sherratt one is a bit long at four years, but still he's, He's a great writer and presence, and I'm sure he'll be okay. But I, I think, yeah, I mean, <laughs> they had to do it at some point, and they have money to spend, and I don't think he spent it foolishly. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think it's like it was crazy what he went out and did. It's just he got lucky that he got these deals done. So, um, but, you know, David Prawn said, he's like, you know, when Steve Eisenman calls, you, you, you listen. <laughs> you know? so, so, yeah. He has like going for him, I guess. <laughs> oh, it's a big name when you see his name come up on your phone. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, those are huge moves for the Red Wings. I mean, it's funny. I had a feeling. I said on um, a podcast yesterday, I was doing some predictions of where um, free agents were going to go. And I had I had uh, Nazem Kadri going there, too. Mm-hmm. And Peron, I actually had going to Detroit. Um, and the thing is, I thought there's something happening with Steve Eisenman. He's going to be doing something. And well, it looks like I spidey senses were right. So, <laughs> uh, Colin, let's move over to the senators who, again, they made a bunch of trade. I mean, they made a one big signing today in Giroux, but before they got to Brinkat, they also got Talbot. Um, are they a much stronger team? Do you see them, uh, making a push to the playoffs this year? Like Melissa said, it's all within the context of the Atlantic division. Uh, That's all of a sudden going to be very deep. I'm anxious to see if Boston takes a step back, Mm. but it's one of those things. And we say this all the time in the Metro with Pittsburgh and Washington until they actually take that step back. Don't just count on it actually happening. So Boston's an interesting team, but that's the one I would say would be easiest to supplant for a playoff spot for either Ottawa Mm -hmm. or Detroit. I would say Detroit's a little bit more likely than Ottawa, just basically one step higher in the pecking order. Mm -hmm. But Ottawa, yes, they did get a lot better with that addition of Claude Giroux. Um, And as you mentioned, Dabrinkit, I've always liked um, Shabbat on defense. Mm -hmm. Brady Kachuk brings a lot of intensity. He's the type of player that, I really fell in love with the game because of the way he goes out there and competes. And Ottawa all of a sudden has a really formidable top six, adding all those guys. They've got some offensive firepower. I don't know if one year removed from being towards the bottom tier of the NHL, they're just going to make the jump right into the playoffs, but they're certainly trending in the right direction. Yeah, well, both those teams have made huge moves, I think, from maybe they've decided this is time we're going to move away from our rebuild and try to get to being become playoff teams. Because well, you know Giroux very well from his time in Philly and uh, didn't go well in Florida for him. But now he's he's in Ottawa and he signed for I can't remember the, the deal what it was, how many years? Three, uh, three, three years. Um... Three years. So 
He signed for three years. It's pretty good. It's not really long term. It's it's manageable. Um, and now he'll go behind Stutzla and uh, you know mentor him too um, because he's still really young in the league. So um, it's going to be interesting to see what both these teams do next year because again, two teams are going to be more exciting to watch as well. So let's move to um, the Rangers and Vinny Trocheck. Um, Austin. This move, I, I don't know. I, I didn't really see Trocek going to the Rangers, but uh, he signed for a long-term deal too, seven years. Um, and I had him as a target for the Canucks. Now I'm glad they didn't sign him because if that's what he wanted, I don't want him here. So um, what do you think about his fit in, in New York now that they got, I mean, Ryan Strom's gone. Uh, he's basically the second line center, probably playing with Artemi Panarin, which is a pretty good spot to be in. Now, what do you think about that signing? Yeah, I like the money, but like you said, the term's really, really long. Seven years for a guy at that age is just you're kind of accepting the fact that at the end of that contract, you're overpaying him pretty bad, which it is what it is. They might think this is a big-time cup window for him. Uh, I do think he is uh, upgraded on Ryan Strom. He's really, really good two ways, great on face-offs. And uh, as you pointed out, he's going to be playing with Panarin, and we know that Panarin's a guy that can really uh, – Inflate your numbers seemed a little harsh on the guy he's played with, but you're going to put up numbers playing with Panarin. Just kind of, you're going to get a couple goals and just put the puck on your stick. Uh, so I, I don't know. I'm still up and down on this deal just because that term really scares me with him. Mm -hmm. He's a really good player. I think he's in an upper echelon of like true second line centers, but he's just so long. <laughs> Seven years. I hate those. I like the four. I think four years is like the yeah. sweet spot. You sign these guys for four years. You're you're not signing a ridiculous long time, and it's mm. still in the realms like, well, if they decline, whatever, we can still trade them, and there's not a lot of term on mm. it for you know how hard it is to trade these guys on long term contracts. You have to most most likely you have to buy them out, and that uh, yeah. that doesn't help you uh, in the long run, right? Okay, let's go to another guy. Now let's go out west and talk about the Dallas Stars, who didn't do a ton of moves today, but uh, got Mason Marchman. Um, that one was a weird one because he was supposed to go somewhere else um, before that. It was tweeted out. I don't remember what team it was. Carolina, I think. Carolina, yeah. And it was tweeted out that first, and then it switched to the Stars. So, I mean, it's always fluid in fluid situations with this stuff. Um Melissa, what do you think about this one? Uh, Marchment was in Florida, um, had a really yeah. great season. Third line, he played with, um, he played on the third line in Florida and had like 20 goals, I believe it was. So what do you think about uh, that signing for Dallas? Yeah, obviously one of the feel-good stories of the day as well, um, knowing that his father passed away uh, mm -hmm. recent, uh, last week. Dropped so one of the good stories that uh, he got that deal done, but yeah, you know, I guess Dallas was looking for a forward uh, to fill in, and uh, that seems like a good fit for him. And like you said, it's right in the sweet spot, the four-year deal. So I think that's good for Dallas. Uh, and, you know, good news on a day when it sounds like they're not getting John Klingberg back. So mm -hmm. at least they were able to do that, and as well as Colin Miller. So, you know some positive news for the stars today <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh they got such a bright future prospect wise too i mean i don't think yep. they should be signing guys to long-term deals because they got some good guys coming uh, you have to have spots for them because <laughs> <laughs> they got some good uh, some good prospects in the system this would be great um i didn't put this on the outline but i want to ask you colin about this one because um he was on the flyers and it's great he got signed by someone but uh, oscar Lindblom, i Bought out by the Flyers, um, signs in San Jose. Um, what do you think about this signing for San Jose? Uh, for the player, for himself, because, you know, he, what he had to battle and to come back in the NHL. Uh, what do you think about that one? Sure. And his fight with Ewing Sarcoma a couple of years ago, Oscar Lindblom, obviously one of the more respected players on the Philadelphia Flyers. The decision to buy him out, obviously not going to be an easy one, but it was for cap compliance. The Flyers are just really tight against the cap, especially with the acquisition of Tony D'Angelo last week. There was even rumors that they were going to trade James Van Riemsdyk today to get rid of his $7 million and attach a first-round pick to it because that would have been the cost. That's how desperate they are. Fortunately, that didn't happen. But with Lindblom, I think it's great to see these types of stories continue in the NHL. Because although he did get bought out, the Flyers 
decided he wasn't worth that three million in AAV. They mm. also donated a hundred thousand dollars to cancer charities, um, just at the same time to lighten the PR hit, yes, but also to do a nice thing for the greater good mm -hmm. in the hockey universe. And Lindblom, a great character guy, a very hard worker. And let's not forget, it's not exactly easy to come back from chemotherapy mm. and play in the NHL. Yeah. Um, so physically, the past two seasons probably have taken their toll. Maybe he'll be in a little bit better, uh, a little bit better health, better conditioning mm. to contribute for the Sharks next year. Yeah, and Mike Greer, a uh, new GM in San Jose too, and uh, I, I think that really kind of matches what how he played uh, too. So it's kind of a, a good fit um, signing him uh, as one of his first signings as a GM. So that was great. Okay, let's go to the team that I cover, the Vancouver Canucks, and uh, I wanted to ask you about this one, Austin, because well, he's in the division now. Uh, Elon Mikheyev, who's uh, Toronto Maple Leafs, he was playing top six middle six kind of time in Toronto at 20 goals, best season um, signed for a little over 4 million. I think it's a little too much money for him, but I like the signing. What do you think about McKay in Vancouver? Yeah. On the money, I think you're banking on him being more of that 20 goal scorer instead of like the 10, eight goal score. It was before that. But when I think of McKay, I think of two like real hockey cliches. One He's the kind of guy a coach loves and everyone wants on their team. And two, he's the kind of guy you need to win. And I hate yeah, using cliches yeah. like that, but that's really what play. I've seen him. Yeah, yeah, hard to play. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he reminds me a little of Arturi Lekkinen that went over to Colorado at the end of the year. Just really good middle six guy, can bring some offense, kills penalties really well. I, I like this move for Vancouver. Mm -hmm. I think their team, like I mentioned, Calgary's probably dropping out of that first place spot in the Pacific. I don't think they're ready for that jump, but I do think they're a team that can fill that spot, that playoff spot that Calgary is going to lead because they look so good under Bruce Boudreau. Mm -hmm. They've made some good moves, McKayev being one of them. And even though they're probably going to lose JT Miller, there's more than enough there for them to make a big splash next season. Yeah. And it's funny. Canucks fans, uh, you know, they want, they want management to do things and then they still are not happy. Um, yeah. <laughs> There was, oh, when McCabe was signed, they're like, ah, oh, it's Jim Benning again. And I'm like, like <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I love the signing. He's 27. He's not old. He's not that over 30. Uh, you didn't sign him for a long time, four years. Like I say, that sweet spot of contracts. Um, and he brings a lot. I think he's a, you know, he brings a lot of speed. And like you say, penalty killing. He can play up and down your lineup. He can play on the top line. He can play on your third line. Um he can do a lot. And I think that's a big thing for him. And he may not be worth 4.7, but you're banking, like you say, you're banking on him getting better. And uh, there was a talk, there was talk about out of Vancouver that they signed him for two years from now. They didn't sign him for now um, because they think in two years, the Canucks are going to be a really formidable team playoff team that he can make a difference in the playoffs, which I do definitely agree with. Yeah, um, so. I think he gives him some, a little bit of security too. If Kuzmenko comes over and doesn't yeah. translate well, he can kind of fill the void you were hoping Kuzmenko does. So that's a nice, little nice kind of fallback plan for him there. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a good, I mean, it's a good move. I think yeah, for, I for the Canucks and um, you know, I didn't expect it. I, I don't think he was rumored to, as being a target. I know I kind of maybe heard his name a couple of times, but I thought another team was just going to be crazy overpay for him and, and sign him. So I'm glad that the Canucks were able to um, convince him to come to Vancouver because uh, he's a big piece. And again, the Canucks were saying they want to add grit and sandpaper and speed. And uh, he brings the speed for sure. And he is a bit uh, of a physical, um, he's not afraid to get into the corners. He's not a small guy either. So uh, I, I think it's a great signing for the Canucks for sure. Okay, let's move to away from signings to re-signings, uh, extensions. And the Tampa Bay Lightning, they signed Ian Cole. I mean, that, not a big deal. But uh, they re-signed a ton of big, big pieces. So started with um, Mikhail Sergachev. He signed eight-year deal. I believe it was still – I think we're all eight-year deals. So, uh, yeah, it was. So then it was Sorelli about, what, 15 minutes later – eight-year deal again. And then uh, finally, Eric Cernak, another eight-year deal. Um, 
Melissa, what do you think about this? You know, extensions galore in Tampa Bay. <laughs> Tampa Bay Lightning don't do business like anybody else, do they? Um, <laughs> Julian Brees was on his own island over here. So he know he knows stuff about the cap that nobody else knows, apparently. Um, but you know, I I guess you know that's probably why they're they're uh, you know a dynasty because yeah. they just make sure that their core pieces are signed and um, are long term, and they. It's tough to move money out. Like, you know, obviously we saw how tough it was for him to move Ryan McDonough. He didn't want to do it, but he did it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andre Pilat's not coming back. So, you know, they they keep their core intact and um, they just, you know, fill in fill in the edges where they need it. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's amazing how they just do it every year. Like, yeah, like meanwhile, he's over here signing three eight-year deals in the space of, 30 minutes um and it was funny I was reading that uh Sergei Tev, uh eventually is going to make have a higher AAV than uh Victor Hedman oh. on his contract so interesting there um hopefully uh he can continue progressing because that's a big big deal for him but yeah you know, Julia Breesbaugh does it again. <laughs> Strikes again. <laughs> well, they're all going to be there potentially um, until they're like 34, 35 years old. So they all for, for went um, free agency and in their prime because yeah. if they would have gone a couple more, more years, they're all free, unrestricted free agents. So mm-hmm. they, they, I mean, obviously they believe Tampa Bay is a championship level team and, you know, to be a part of that for a long term and thinking that, they're still going to be Stanley cup contenders for a while. Um, that's big uh, for guys to be signing that long um, and staying there. So, and they're all key, huge pieces of the team. I mean, yep. massive for winning those cups. So um, ta- good on Tampa Bay for getting those done while all the other teams are signing free agents and big contracts, <laughs> not sure what they're going to get with them. Right. Well, these, these guys, they definitely know what they're getting. Okay, let's move away from signings um, to more things that happened this <laughs> today is trades. It should have been called trade deadline slash free agency because I think it was more exciting than the normal trade deadline. Um, let's start in Carolina, who was really, again, really busy in the trade market, but not in free agency. They only signed Andre Kasha, um, but made two big trades. So let's start with the Brent Burns one. Uh, Austin, you're equipped to answer this one because uh, he's been in our in the you know, Pacific division for his, almost his whole career. Um, so what do you think about Brent Burns going from San Jose to the Carolina hurricanes? Yeah. When I saw that at first, I just thought that's their Tony D'Angelo replacement. And I really like that Tony D'Angelo replacement for a couple of reasons. Obviously uh, Brett Burns, one thing we know about him for sure. He's a great guy in the locker room. Like everyone mm-hmm. that plays with him only has good things to say. He's everyone's favorite teammate. And that's always a good thing to have. That's something that Rob Brenda more really, values and his players so i think it's a good fit there and put him next to jacob slavin and you have a perfect balance of defensive defenseman high-flying offensive defenseman yeah. and a ton of size brett burns is massive <laughs> jacob slavin's massive it's not a fun pairing to play against i really like that move and you got him for basically nothing nothing because san jose's shedding cap right now i thought that was a yeah. really good move for uh, carolina yeah well that was the name of the game was targeting teams with uh, salary cap issues. So <laughs> I, Colin, what do you think about Brent Burns going to Carolina? I mean, this kind of bolsters their blue line. Um, not like D'Angelo was bad. I mean, he had 50 points, but uh, what do you think about Burns? Does he shift anything in the, in that division or is it that it's just a replacement and uh, that's all? Yeah. So before this trade came down, um, we were asked to pick the winners and the losers. I put the hurricanes right on my list of the losers. <laughs> um, and then the news broke. So it, it makes a lot of sense. You needed that replacement for D'Angelo. You lost all these guys like Domi walked. Um, Vinny Trocek went to the Rangers. You needed to get some firepower here. And that's exactly what they did. Um, it, you pick up a veteran like Burns. I think he can be rejuvenated. It's not ideal Brent Burns, but like Austin said, playing next to Jacob Slavin, a lot of people look better. <laughs> Tony D'Angelo did last year, and he's not <laughs> the strongest defensive defenseman. So I think that's a good, a good compliment, good dynamic there 
for the Carolina Hurricanes. And Burns is like, well, like Austin said, he's so big. He's such a big <laughs> guy. And and he's still mobile at his age, too. He's still a really good defenseman. So, um, again, big cap hit. Um, but San Jose's taking on a bit of that cap hit, I believe, as well. They're retaining a bit of salary. So, I mean, they're not taking the full amount. Let's move to the other one. Uh, Melissa, you know Max Pacioretty quite well uh, from his time in Montreal. I mean, he hasn't been there for a while. He's been in Vegas. But what do you think about this one? I mean, Vegas had to, again, they, they don't seem to know the concept of the salary cap. So they had to do deal another big player for nothing. And this is literally nothing for future considerations. Um, they traded Patch and Dylan Coughlin um, to the Carolina Hurricanes. So what do you think about this one? Patch going to the Hurricanes, basically, well, for basically nothing. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, probably the biggest, you know, Habs related news <laughs> in free agency that we got today, other than the Slavkovsky signing. But yeah, um, yeah I mean, I, you know, to, I'll start by saying I don't feel bad for Vegas. No. <laughs> uh, that they had to do this. And it's amazing to me that um, Max Pacioretty is one of the most consistent goal scorers in the NHL. I think over the last five years, he's averaging something like 35 goals or something. Um, like, this is just a result of not only, like, they were handed a very, very good team when they came into the yeah. league. And they have thrown it all down the drain um based on just based out of for uh asset management just to give you an example if you don't remember the max maturity trade to begin with they traded nick suzuki thomas tatar and mati and the draft pick who became matthias norlander to the canadians (laughs) um and now they're giving up that guy after three years and no sort of sniff at the Stanley cup for nothing um yeah i mean great for carolina i think that's a great move for carolina they needed um they were also in addition to the top 4d that they were looking for they were looking for some uh punch up front as well so great for max and hill you know the max will be motivated it's uh year one year before free agency so they'll probably put up some more big numbers so but just you know uh, all of this so that they could sign Jack Eichel and Alex, or they could trade for Jack Eichel and sign mm-hmm. Alex Petrangelo. So yeah, yeah. I, and I like I went through the I went through the list of guys they had to trade away, and it's insane uh, the amount of talent that they have to get. They got rid of with basically nothing, um, mm-hmm. either draft picks, low draft picks, or uh, low end prospect, mid range prospects, or future considerations, which means nothing. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that actually means. Do they go back to them saying, oh, I want this now? I, d- I don't know. I, It's like that they're just like basically a fancy <laughs> word for nothing. It's like we're just going to give it even less you. than the guy you want on your team. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that one I don't understand of like how, what teams, and then you're looking at, well, why didn't another team try for that? Like mm. what makes it Pacioretty wanting, you know, that Caroline is the team. So I don't know. I mean, any team could have gotten for nothing then. <laughs> he does have a big cap hit at seven million, that, so yeah, it's a lot to good. absorb without yeah. giving something back. But um, Vegas probably wants him in the East as well. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. true. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so that 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 was an interesting one. Again, Vegas having to, uh, you know, and they don't. Riley Smith is still out there too. Uh, I don't know if they're they going to try. They signed him to, apparently uh, just did. before we got on. Yeah. So, okay, so they that uh, was the reason. That. Yeah. That was the reason. Okay. So that yeah. was the reason they tra- had to trade Patch ready to get Riley Smith uh, signed. So you can see who they think is a more valuable player. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was one trade. That was probably the biggest trades of the day. But um, the first one was Pavel Zaka to the Bruins and Eric Halla to the Devils. Um, you know, Colin, what do you think about that one? I mean, Zaka has been on, kind of like on the trade block for a bit. Um, and Halla played pretty well in Boston, the second line center. Um, I believe it was the second line center when they kind of shifted things around. Um, does this really do us? It's just kind of a one for one, see what each can do in each place. I think you already said it. It's a one for one. Neither of these guys are particularly special to where yeah. you're going to jump out of your seat for it. And like I said earlier about Boston, 
I don't know exactly the direction that they're going. And this seems like somewhat of a lateral move. Yeah. So you, you're not getting that many answers here. Uh, Zaka, I don't think he's really the smartest player on the ice, at least not reputation wise. Mm-hmm. So I have seen him in New Jersey a little bit. Uh, but not on a nightly basis. Um, so I, I don't think there's much luster to this trade at all. <laughs> I, I agree. I, I'm glad we had another like couple. Like the no answer. <laughs> answer. <laughs> I basically made, gave the answer to my own question I was talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, finish off this first day of craziness. Um, let's do some quick hit things. Um, there are some big names left on the market still. We've got, uh, you know, Goudreau's gone. He was part of this list before, but then I had to remove him. Um, so we still have Nazem Kadri out there. We got uh, Klingberg. We got Niederreiter. Um, there's a few others, but um, we'll start with you, Austin. Uh, where do you think these three will go? I uh, have any predictions. Uh, we'll start with Kadri. I mean, uh, he's one of the big names still left on the market. Um, probably has a lot of offers kind of mulling over. So who do you think he ultimately goes to? Yeah, Kadri's just such a tough one because he's going to be 32 at the start of next season, coming off a career year. Mm-hmm. He's probably going to want a big contract. It's like, uh, I'd be so worried about giving him a big one. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of thinking now the Islanders might go really hard for him after missing out on Johnny Gaudreau. I don't want to say they're going to panic, but they might kind of uh, try and make up for that lost superstar and go after uh, Kadri. I know he was rumored there a little bit before, and now I think, Blue Lamarill might be chasing a big name and go after him. Mm. Yeah, well, he missed out on Goudreau. He was big. It's well rumored that uh, they were going big for him. So uh, they're going to have to revert to plan B, whatever yeah. that is. <laughs> uh, Colin, what do you think about Klingberg? I mean, he's probably the best defenseman left on the market now. Um, probably was the best defenseman on the market. Um, where do you think he ends up? Well, I read today Frank Saravalli is reporting that the stars are not really off the table, mm-hmm. which is apart from what people expected leading up to free agency, but we'll see how that plays out. Klingberg, though, I think he might be a fit with the Seattle Kraken. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know exactly how far they want to go with their aggression in free agency. They did get Burakovsky earlier. So I guess they're over what they did last summer of really standing pat in the expansion draft and trying to rack up draft picks cap space because they did get a big name forward and maybe they go after a big name defenseman like Klingberg. Yeah, that that's, uh, I mean, Seattle sells a lot of cap space. They did make some moves today, uh, but I mean, nothing really massive in, in numbers. Um, Melissa, what do you think about Nino Niederreiter now that the, Basically, the Hurricanes have, I don't know if they're looking at him again. I mean, they let him go to free agency, but now they got Patch ready. So yeah. um, he's probably going somewhere else. So what do you think? Uh, where do you think he's going? Yeah, he's probably going somewhere else. But I, I feel like uh, maybe uh, not Kadri so much, but I feel like Klingberg and, uh, you know, Strom, the Strom brothers. And, you know, I feel like it's been so quiet around them. It yeah. feels like some wild card team's going to come in and you go, oh, <laughs> I didn't even, you know, kind of like Gaudreau a little bit. I didn't even think that was a possibility. So I think for Trochek, it might be the same. Could Calgary be interested? Uh, I know you can't replace Gaudreau. Obviously, it's impossible, but they're going to need some top six, somebody in their top six, I would assume. I don't think Calgary is going to start, you know, torching it to the ground Yeah. Uh, because they lost Goudreau. So maybe there is a fit, um, but not sure. But other than that, yeah, he just seems like a wild card. And from what I can tell by the insiders, they're not really sure. They don't really have any sort yeah. of intel as to who might be interested. And But I agree. I don't think he's going back to Carolina now. No. And the thing is, Calgary, I think, is going to turn to trades now. I don't think there's anyone on the free agent market that, um, I mean, they could maybe go for Kadri, look at him. But uh, like you say, he's not the youngest guy. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll see what what Calgary does now. They've lost their superstar and one of their big guys that, you know, scored over 100 points. Um, that's going to be hard to replace. Uh, so they're talking about JT Miller, too. And I'm like, please, no. <laughs> don't, don't trade him to Calgary, please. Don't do that. Uh, unless we have Matthew, unless the Canucks get Matthew Kachuk in the deal, I'm, I'd be okay with that one. But uh, 
<laughs> I don't think that's happening either. Okay, let's get to some winners and losers because we always have to pick those after these days. So uh, we'll start with you, Melissa. Who's a winner on this day? It doesn't have to be for free agency. It could be for trades. Mm -hmm. um, anything they did on day one. Well, I think, uh, I mean, I think you have to say Columbus. I mean, they, they got the biggest fish and uh, it's a big day for their team and for their franchise and for their city. And, you know, Yarmo, you know, he does things <laughs> that, you know, he, he, it's always in the back, you know, in the yeah. way. So, I mean, I, I think just, just based on the fact you all, they always, you always say that about the draft too, is like, well, who got the best player? And I think, you know, you have to give them at least consideration as being one of the winners today because they got the best player. Yeah. They weren't ending up to be the winners uh, before they did I, that. But I but. say that and I, but, uh, I will say, I think the good Branson signing by Yarmo is probably the worst one of the oh, day. So yeah. he, he, um, he really, uh, you know, made up for that one in a hurry. Well, he had some, he had like some couple Calgary flames there. So uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, I know I've got Branson very well in Vancouver here and I'm like too much money, 4 million, <laughs> too much money for a guy like that. I, for a guy that's slow and I mean, he's big, but he's slow. Uh, and who knows how he got chosen second overall, but that's another, <laughs> that's another discussion. Wow. Um, Colin, what, what do you think? Uh, who's the winners from day one? I think the Red Wings are a big winner. We talked about them towards the beginning, but um, bringing in David Perron and Andrew Kopp, especially, uh, yeah. I think those were great pickups. I'm happy that the Iser plan is getting going. <laughs> Um, and that they're kind of past this rebuild and ready to be this aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. Red Wings are first me. Um, I'll say my winner right now. Red Wings are definitely winners. Uh, they, they just added so many guys that are going to really help out uh, next season for sure. Uh, I'll finish up with you, Austin. Uh, who are you seeing as a winner on day one of free agency? Carolina is my big winner. Just getting Brett Burns and Max Patch ready for essentially nothing is so huge for them. Obviously we talked about the Burns fit and Patch ready. Uh, like most said, one of the most consistent goal scorers in the league. And I know that team was wanting some more grit, some more nastiness, especially up at the top of their lineup. And Patrick brings that in bunches. So I think both those guys are such a good fit at such a low like asset cost for them. I love those deals. I think they're a winner. Yeah, big winners for Carolina and big winners for the Western Conference too. Yeah. There's two guys that you don't have to deal with anymore <laughs> as much. <laughs> Especially for the Pacific Division. I uh, I'm I'm really happy for that for the Canucks because both those players really good whenever they played against Vancouver. So okay, well, we always have we have to have losers because uh what's winners without losers? So <laughs> uh we'll start with uh Austin here. Uh who was a loser? Who was surprisingly quiet that should have been doing something on day one? I mean, not necessarily it's a bad thing because, you know, sometimes these these ones, when you do sign contracts like this, it's, you become a loser because of what you signed. But uh, what do you think? Obviously, Vegas losing patch right for nothing makes them at least somewhat of a loser. Yeah. <laughs> uh, surprisingly quiet for me was Winnipeg, just because I think they only have like eight forwards under contract yeah. right now, and they did nothing no news on Pierre Luc Dubois didn't go after really any free agents that I'm aware of and they need to do something they can't fill a roster out right now so yeah. they were surprisingly quiet in my eyes I don't know what they're going to do over there they're I think they're still trying to figure out if they're going to tear it down or what their plan is but I was surprised they didn't do anything yeah I that was a team that kind of was surprising I think they signed they signed a backup goaltender off the top of my head, I'm not sure who it was. I think it was David Riddick. David Riddick. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It was David Riddick. He, and yeah. that's not a massive signing. Um, so I mean, I mean, he does a good backup. Uh, we'll see what he can do there. Uh, Colin, who do you feel as being uh, surprisingly quiet on day one that probably should have been in on some of these guys? I do not think that the Minnesota Wild are in great shape right now. Um, it just their all together strategy here. They already lost Fiala. Um, I don't know if Mark Andre Fleury really has that much left in the tank, mm. even though he's kind of eluded Father Time before. But I think you guys could probably take a wild guess <laughs> and say my biggest loser for the day it's the Flyers, because <laughs> I, I just really don't know 
what their strategy is. Yeah. They seem like they're taking shots in the dark. Everybody was talking about Johnny Gaudreau, and then they didn't get him. And then Chuck Fletcher goes to the podium today and says, no, we were never in on Johnny Gaudreau. <laughs> what, what were all these reports going yeah, like- on that you were – working on trades and all this. I don't know. And then they re-signed Justin Braun, who was a decent hockey player. But your move, instead of bringing in the hometown hero, Johnny Gaudreau, who everybody wants this big star player, is to bring back a depth defenseman (laughs) traded at the deadline in one of the worst seasons in your franchise history. I got uh, this depth defenseman. I don't <laughs> want to kill Braun, but I just don't like it. <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah, the Philadelphia Flyers is interesting what they're doing. I don't know. Um, like it's day one. There's so much more of the offseason still to go. I mean, they could do some trades. There's been talk about that. Um, so I, we'll see what Philly does in the next few months here. Um, Melissa, I'll finish off with you. Uh, who is a loser and surprisingly quiet on day one of free agency? Well, I don't know if it's because I watched too much TSN today or maybe it's my hot bias. I don't know. But uh, I got to say Toronto. Uh, um, I don't know if I guess Colin and Austin weren't watching TSN today, but boy, oh boy, are, were they not impressed. <laughs> uh, Toronto's direction for goaltending. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and that is no i i think obviously it's the same story all the time for the maple leafs their cap uh you know tight they can't yeah. do anything right we know that but um i just think like based and also as we were mentioned talking about earlier just the way ottawa improved or the way detroit improved the way you're like, oh, geez, like, I don't know. Um, they, they still don't have, you know, a decent third line. They lost Mikheyev. They, you know, they've signed really depth forwards that are, I think, you know, going to be fourth liners at best. Um, and yeah, like their, their goaltending is very suspect. So I think, well, not proven anyways, we'll say that. So I think, yeah, I, to me, I think they are. I think they, they've taken a step back today, I think. So we'll see if he can pull some, Dubas can pull something else out, but um, yeah. Yeah. Well, they lost, they, well, they lost Campbell. They lost Mikheyev, uh and Kasha too. I mean, Kasha was yep. pretty good bottom six guy for them. And now you got, you lost three big pieces and yep. what they only do, they only address their goaltending and that's, yeah, and um, <laughs> oh, and um, Obe Kubel, I think. And, Obe uh, Kubel, yeah, which is so fine, okay. But, I mean, yeah, he's, exactly. he's an like, okay player. Okay, I mean, he's but, a good, yeah. good third, fourth line guy, but yeah. he doesn't move the needle, uh, especially when you're looking at who they lost in Mikheyev for sure. Um, and then, yeah. I mean, Kasha, like I said, was a really good uh, depth forward and um, pretty good for them. So um, yeah, I would say Toronto's probably out, out in that range too. But like I said, this is day one. Um, yeah, lots like, of stuff can still happen. I'm surprised also that they haven't tried to move out some salary, um, whether it's Justin Hall or Jake Muzz yeah, or something. Yeah. Um, like you said, it's early. Maybe they will, but uh, yeah. So. Yeah. So, I mean, the Canucks are in the same boat. They got to move salary too. And they just added a bunch um, in McKayev and, like I said, they have seven million in in space right now because putting Furland on LTIR and all that stuff. But um, they still need some space. So, <laughs> and they haven't addressed their defense yet either. Wow. Let's get to our last question, and this is one that I, I like asking because you know these contracts are great right now because you don't know what's going to happen with these guys. But we always have at least one or two that you look back and you're like, "What the heck were you doing? Why did you sign this contract? This is ridiculous." Um, I can probably guess one of them already because we kind of complained about it too, already. But <laughs> Austin, who? What do you think? What team? What GM will regret one of these? I mean, he he may be fired because of it. Who knows? But uh, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I don't think he'll be fired for it, but I do think Yarmo Kekalainen is going to look back at that Gubranza contract and just hate it. <laughs> I mean, I think everyone's kind of everyone's just focused on the Goudreau signing, but. Three hours ago, people were just dunking all over <laughs> that contract. It's so much money. It's so long for that guy. Yeah. Um, but we, like I said, we already kind of touched on it. I think they're I'm, – I'm a big fan of Mikhail Sergachev. I do think he'll get better and he will play into that contract. But you yeah. are taking a risk that if he does not improve, you're overpaying him. You're paying him as a number one defenseman, and yeah. he isn't that right now. And if he doesn't develop into that, you're 
gold painted by quite a bit for a long time. So that mm-hmm. one's I don't I personally don't think that will be one, but it's possible. It is yeah. very possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. When you get up to that five to eight year range, it, it can get to be that point for sure, especially when they get over 30 yeah. uh, and you're looking at your back end of your career. So uh, we'll see. Uh, Colin, what do you think? Bad contract uh, that uh, GM's going to regret. Penguins have decided to bring back Ricard Raquel on a big ticket. Mm-hmm. Um, the, all the talk was about how they were going to prioritize Malkin and Latang, and they did. You would think that they would have to only prioritize those guys, though, but they signed Ricard Raquel to a five-year deal. Um, I, I just thought it was a little lofty mm. for him. And then um, I already said I liked what Detroit did, and this guy is low risk to give Iserman credit, but I have never thought Ole Mata mm. was the best defenseman he made some questionable decisions in the playoff runs that he's had over the years, especially. I don't love adding him to the Detroit blue line. Yeah. Um, well, Matt has been, I mean, he's been serviceable, but uh, yeah, well, we'll see. What yeah, they didn't give him too much money. So it's yeah, risk. it's not massive. Uh, it's not massive risk, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. I, I like the Sherratt one, even though it's again, a little bit more money, but I think it's gonna be perfect with cider <laughs> um, on that blue yeah. line. So Okay, Melissa, we'll end with you. Uh, what do you think is a bad contract that was signed um, either today or, you know, beforehand? Well, you know, our from our time on Chicks and Sticks, our obsession with seven and eight year deals. So yes. I'm going to say, <laughs> I'm gonna have to say Vincent Trocek yes. for me. I think that that contract is going to age poorly, uh, especially considering that they let Andrew Kopp go mm-hmm. and he signed for two years less for less money yeah to accomplish essentially the same role so it's an interesting decision i mean i'm you know i like i think it was colin who said how you know coffin's charge i guess probably one of the best second line centers in the nhl but seven years it's a <laughs> long time <laughs> yeah like i say i don't like those contracts i think that's the max you can sign now yeah in free agency i think if eight yeah, if it's is your, your team yeah yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we're not doing those crazy 10 year craziness <laughs> that they used to do. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, I'm going with Trocheck as the bad contract for me. And because like I already said, I don't like those seven year deals. They're just too long. Um, four is the sweet spot halfway through that. And you still have, you know, you go through a couple of years and then you can trade them and there's still that turn that teams are like, Oh yeah, I can take them on for a year or two. Um, but when you get up to that six, seven, I can, I don't want that anymore. I don't want a five-year deal guy that's already struggled because you're trading him within that, you know, a few years in something's mm-hmm. happening. That's wrong. So, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see how all this kind of plays out and we won't know until like a few years down the road on these. So we may know after one year, you never know. I mean, if all of a sudden one guy only puts up two goals and yeah, you have a problem. So that was day one. I. Uh, we have probably have a lot more and uh, we may have another show tomorrow. Um, uh, it's depending on how many more things happen. Um, probably be a, a shorter show because there won't be as much, but, um, thanks Melissa. Thanks Colin. Thanks Austin for, uh, coming on the show and talking free agency and, uh, and day one of the, what they call free agent frenzy, the crazy season of, uh, of signings, all the money getting flown, flown around. I think how Cardi cap friendly was like 150 deals or something happened. Crazy numbers. So, I wish I could make that type of money, at, uh, uh-huh. not a hockey player. So, all right. So thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, it was a little bit over an hour show, but uh, thanks for joining us. Whatever segment you tuned into, I uh, <laughs> clicked on the YouTube uh, timestamps. I'm sure no, a lot of people are not watching this whole thing, but uh, if you did, thanks for sticking around for the whole thing. Um, and uh, check us all out on the hockeywriters.com. We'll have, of course, covering our teams as whatever happens uh, throughout this next uh off season and what other changes that happen in the NHL. And uh, we'll be back throughout the year with season previews as well. So stick around for that. And uh, of course, check us out to our podcast, the audio only one um, throughout off season as well. So thanks for joining us and uh, we will see you next time.